At that time, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a virgin named Mary. And the angel, being come in, said unto her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Words taken from the gospel, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The famous Flemish painter Jan van Eyck, or Eck, captured this gospel scene in a finely detailed painting made for an altarpiece. Jan was born around 1380 and he died in Bruges in July of 1441. He painted this piece late in his life, around 1436. A year after his death, he was taken up and buried in a cathedral at Bruges. A little later, his daughter entered religious life. These are clear signs that this Renaissance painter was actually a virtuous man, unlike so many of his contemporaries. Why bring up this painting of the Annunciation on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Because it is filled with things upon which to meditate and edify our faith. And by the way, you can find this painting online to view in minute detail. And it is available in print as well, at least it was from the store at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It might make a good Christmas gift. In Jan's painting, the lady, Our Lady, is depicted as receiving the angel Gabriel inside a large pillared church or cathedral with stained glass windows. Recall how St. John of the Cross says the cosmos, the universe, is a palace for the bride. It is a temple for the bride. Christians of the first century said the world was created for the sake of the church, for the sake of the bride. We hear an echo of this in Blessed Francis Palau's writings where he states, having conceived the plan, God uttered one word, and that word was the building of his church in the course of the centuries. The holy triumphant church is the end to whose glory everything in the entire universe are created. She is the mistress of the universe. Blessed Francis Palau, that 19th century Carmelite mystic, he goes on to add, Blessed Mary is a clear mirror in which the Holy Church can be seen. She's the Church's perfect member. The world is made for the bride and is best captured at once in the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is her palace. She is its queen. And so Jan rightly depicts her royally dressed with airmen, trimmed garments, and crown. The only stained glass window of note in this cosmic cathedral shows an image of his majesty, the word incarnate, standing on the world with two angels above him. He holds an open book in his hands. As the psalm says, he was made a little less than the angels by taking our human nature, by being placed inside the Ark of the Covenant to which that psalm was referring. Now this seems to indicate how the incarnate word is the model, exemplar, or blueprint for the universe. As St. Paul says, he is the firstborn of every creature, in whom were created all things. In other words, the light coming into the temple to give all things form passes through him. On both sides of the stained glass window of our Lord are frescoes of Moses. Moses as being rescued from the Nile on one side and his receiving the name of God and the law from on high on the other. These images of Moses are barely visible, symbolizing the darkness of the Old Testament. Below them are two rounds of Isaac and Jacob. And on the floor below, the Blessed Mother's feet are scenes from the Old Testament, most notably the betrayal of Delilah. She is shown cutting the hair of Samson and barely discernible the death of the traitor Absalom. In other words, man has sinned. 
he has need of a more than a Moses, of a better than Moses. Yet no man can help him. Many have tried. No man can restore all things in Christ. Among the greatest men in the world, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and Samson were unable to effect the needed changes. Something else was required. Something inside the temple was needed. Someone who would never betray his majesty in even the slightest manner. Someone who had no sin and would not sin. Thus the need for the immaculate conception of Our Lady. Also present on the floor are several signs of the zodiac. If you know Jan, he's very detailed in his painting. He's one of the finest painters in the history of the world. Extreme detail. You can look at these things with a magnifying glass. How did he do it? So on the floor are these signs of the zodiac. These astrological signs hint at the presence of the occult, the preternatural or diabolic in the world. These forces seemingly have won the day. They have found a place in the temple, the very palace of God's cosmos, and are influencing and, at times, even directing sinful man with ease. I think we're in one of those times. Someone inside the palace is needed who is free of their sway and dominion. That someone is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Thus, on the floor at the feet of our Immaculate Queen, Jan depicted a couple of key victories, namely that of Samson over the false gods and cruelty of the Philistines, as well as the victory of David over Goliath. These victories are only possible if Gabriel comes with rainbow-like wings, showing the hoped-for promise of a Savior. The archangel is royally yet liturgically dressed in a dalmatic with a very rich cope. The angel speaks, Ave gratia plena, hail full of grace. The spotless bride, the perfect image of the church, places her hands in the position of a priest at mass. She is willing to be a mediatrix as the priest is a mediator at the mass. She is willing to be the neck of the church and she knows she is conceiving a victim, the high priest himself, and the greatest sacrifice will be required. Did not Samson have to die to win the victory, and he died in the shape of a cross? Did not David have to use five smooth stones to bring down Goliath, five of the five wounds of Christ? Also, a footstool is shown in the picture, pointing to how all the occult powers of the world will be placed under this ark. It is there the zodiac sign for Draco, the dragon, is placed. A lily is shown, indicating how she is pure, spotless, and virginal, and will always be victorious. A large open book of the scriptures is set before this queen. She is fulfilling the word of God. She is the woman of Genesis, the one possessed by God from the beginning of his ways mentioned in today's lesson. Here is the ark that survived the flood of Noah, soon to contain the life of the world. Here is the bush approached by Moses that is all of fire with God and soon to contain the word made flesh, yet is not consumed. Here is the golden ark carried by priests to turn back the flooding Jordan and overthrow Jericho so that the chosen people can enter the promised land. Here is the virginal mother of the prophet Isaiah. This spotless bride whom no sin has ever had a place, nor could, is thus able to say fiat, yes, to this conception coming from God. Her answer, ecce ancilla domini, behold the handmaid of the Lord, can only be read from above in the painting. 
while the seven rays of the Holy Ghost come down from an upper window with a dove in the midst. Thus, she is able to do what no man has been able to do before. Bring in the restoration of all things in Christ. The Immaculate Conception is unconquerable. She has dominion over all things. The world is her palace, her footstool. As the perfect image of the church, it has, so to speak, been created for her to be ready for the coming of the bridegroom to dwell in his cosmic cathedral. She said yes, and we must do the same, not forgetting those images on the floor. We are in for a battle against occult forces and must participate in the victimhood of his majesty to crush them, to keep them where they belong, under our feet. Let us then place ourselves in this ark to conquer where no one else can, to crush underfoot the occult powers of the world and all that it has been able to produce, to share in the Lord's Samson-like destruction of the Dagon's temple and in David's cutting off of Goliath's head, and most especially to avoid becoming a traitor, as was Delilah and Absalom. Thank you, Jan van Eyck. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.